You have heard sitar before? Yes, I. You know what it is made of and all that sort of thing? No, a lot of our viewers probably wouldn't know what it is made of. Could you explain it? Perhaps? It's made out of teak wood, completely hollow inside. This portion, as you see, this round portion, is a gourd. And then the smaller gourd here on the top with an opening, which serves as the sound box. There are six main strings for playing, four for melody, and two for rhythm or drone. And underneath there are 13 strings which are tuned differently each time before we play on a raga or the melody forms on which we improvise. And uh, one thing is very interesting that one can pull the strings and get the same note as if I'm playing the frets, like... So you can get the different effects of voice or even board instrument and such. In the, in the past, a lot of Western musicians have tried to learn to play sitar and have had a lot of difficulty, and in fact, most of them have seemed to have given up now. Is it a problem with mastering the technique of the instrument, or is it a problem <coughs> with Indian music as a whole? Well, that's, that's again what I was saying. It takes many years of proper training and uh, long practices, first of, on, on fixed materials, fixed songs, fixed guts, which are the instrumental compositions and then you start getting the insight of raga only after a few years, you know. Otherwise, they are mere succession of notes. A raga, for instance, is very hard to explain otherwise. Um, it, it has to be based on a scale. We have 72 basic scale, you know, full octave scales, 72. And each of these ragas, there are thousands and thousands of ragas, each of them have to be based on a particular scale out of the 72. And uh, it has to have its own ascending and descending structure, principal notes. Then a sort of a little passage which is like the motif for the, uh, what we call the life of the raga, by which you can recognize immediately. It's like a face or the feature of a raga. And after that, all those glissandos and special usage of uh, microtones, you know, embellishments, you give life to the raga. Then raga becomes alive, you know, as far as we are concerned. And each of these raga have their own personality or mood. Some are happy, some are sad, some are romantic, some are very serene. So we have to consider all this and bearing all this in mind, being, you know, very within these rigid principles, we have to improvise and then become as free as a bird, you know. So that's a very difficult... That's why many people misunderstand. They think we improvise the same way as in the jazz. That's not so. You have done some work with Western musicians. Can you see a time when Western music and Indian music and music of other cultures will unite in, in to form a world music? Well, I am not very interested in that. I mean, these things has been happening itself without anyone trying, you know. You find that all the time, especially in the commercial field, commercial music, you find everybody trying, more or less as a gimmick, you know, trying out this, trying out that. But uh, I, in fact, myself, you know, have tried a lot of experimentations in films, ballet music, music for orchestra. But on the other hand, as a classical musician, as a performer of sitar, playing the classical traditional music of India, I believe that these purities should be kept intact. It's good to be enlightened to the other style of music. It's good to be able to appreciate, to understand. You get so much more which we miss otherwise, you know. It doesn't mean one has to mix them up and make, try to make one. I like to see different type of people, different type of dress, different type of food. That's the charm of life. Variety is the spice of life, no?